So today the topic for discussion is uh, conjugate direction method. And the problem is very simple and straightforward. I want to minimize x transpose qx minus b transpose x, x is in Rn. Q is a positive definite matrix. And b is, of course, a vector in Rn. What is the optimal solution to this problem? What's the first derivative and second derivative? Let's try to figure it out. So the first derivative qx minus b, second derivative is q. This is second derivative is a positive definite matrix, so function f is convex. So by setting the first derivative equal to zero, I get the optimal solution the optimal point. And so the solution x star is actually q inverse b. Why is this problem difficult? Why should we come up with an algorithm to solve this problem? Yes. Because the inverse might be uh, computationally inefficient. Yeah, and when is inverse computationally difficult? Uh, if the something has to be very large, I forget what exactly. It's n, if n is very large. So if the dimension of x is very large, then q is an n cross n matrix, and that n cross n matrix inverse will take much, much longer time. So I don't know how many of you have tried, but if you go to MATLAB or any other uh, programming language of your choice, uh, create a random million cross million matrix. Most likely that thing is going to crash on your computer. Okay, so there are situations where you have to solve problems of this type, where the matrices could be very, very large. Uh, it could be, it could happen in fluid if you're trying to do some uh, fluid mechanics type problem. So if you're using a lot of finite difference methods to solve some sort of uh, flow problem, then you get into problems of these kind. Uh, in electromagnetics, I think also you have sometimes problems of this type where, I don't know much about the EM area, but uh, typically you might have situations where this Q could be very, very large. <clears throat> okay, so those are the problems that we want to solve and we want to come up with a gradient ba based method. Remember we were talked about how gradient based methods are much easier to compute. Specifically, if you only have to compute the gradient here, then of course it's much, much easier to compute the gradient because that's only matrix multiplication. Uh, so, so, so that's what we are trying to solve. Uh, what we are going to use is known as conjugate directions, conjugate uh, directions, and so what's the definition? Uh, so a set of vectors, so this is your problem, I think problem two in your assignment. So the definition is uh, D1 to Dn are Q conjugate. vectors if di transpose q dj equals to zero for all i not equal to j.
<coughs> so how do you construct Q conjugate vector? This is what you are going to solve in uh, problem two in the assignment, in the current assignment. So you must be doing it either now or you will be doing it very soon. <coughs> so you can compute these Q conjugate vectors. Uh, so once you compute the Q conjugate vectors, we want to design an algorithm which looks something like this. And so I'm going to connect DK with the gradient very soon but this is what the algorithm is going to look like. So we'll pick Q conjugate vectors uh, and then we will uh, construct this uh, DK using the gradient and then uh, uh, this is the algorithm that we are trying to run in order to solve this problem. <clears throat> and one thing you will notice is throughout this algorithm, we only have to do matrix multiplication, we never have to do any matrix inversion. Okay, so that's the benefit of this particular algorithm. <clears throat> Here, the way I'm going to compute alpha k is using the minimization rule. So I'm going to minimize for all alpha, over all alpha greater than zero, I want to minimize this function. So let's try to solve for alpha k right now. So here f is convex, we've just proved that f is convex and alpha appears, you know, there is of course some vectors but alpha is sort of linear, there is some linear function and then you have a convex function on top of it. So overall this function will also be convex. So the, the argument inside is linear in alpha, so the overall function is going to be convex, so I can just take the first derivative set it equal to zero and I get the value of alpha k. So what is the first derivative here? The gradient of f with respect to alpha at this particular point. So that's given by this expression. So I know that at alpha k, this term has to be zero. So I'm just setting alpha equals to alpha k. Can someone tell me what the value of alpha k looks like? All we have to do is set up, substitute this gradient from here. Uh, yes. Should that be gradient with respect to alpha? This one? Yeah, should this be alpha instead of alpha? No, it should be x because uh, uh, this is like a Taylor series. It comes from the Taylor series formula. So you're taking Taylor series. Uh, of this function around xk plus alpha dk, but this is actually a directional derivative. So that's why you have this transpose dk term. So remember, this is a, this is a scalar, this is a scalar. So on this side, you have to have scalar. So I have a vector transpose dk, which makes it a scalar. So direct, from a dimensionality perspective, this also looks correct.
any other question okay so we are still solving for alpha k and i need to substitute this gradient here so i get q xk plus alpha k dk minus b transpose dk equals to 0 what do i get S xk transpose q dk minus b transpose dk plus alpha k dk transpose q dk equal to 0. Can I get the value of alpha k from here? Okay, let's, uh, let's go through the train of thought once again. So I want to minimize this function. This function is convex. I can actually find the optimal solution fairly easily. But the problem is this Q is a very large matrix. Because Q is a large matrix, I cannot really invert it or at least I don't want to invert this matrix Q because it may not fit within my memory or it might throw up some random error because of the limited size of the RAM. So I need to come up with an iterative method to solve, to get to X star. So the way, the idea that we have is, uh, we'll pick Q conjugate vectors, and then we are going to use the minimization rule for picking alpha K at every time step. And I'm going to optimize, uh, I'm going to get successive values of XK. Uh, so what we have done is we've figured out uh, what alpha k is going to look like. So alpha k can be given by this particular expression. Um, so as long as I know what the q conjugate vectors are, d1 to dn, uh, I can compute the value of alpha k purely through matrix multiplication, right? So this is matrix multiplication, this is matrix multiplication. <laughs> matrix multiplication is much easier. Even if your matrix q is distributed across servers, across different, uh, uh, different servers, you can still do these matrix multiplications somewhat easily. You cannot do matrix inversion that easily, but you can do matrix multiplication very easily, even if Q is distributed across servers. So this part is fairly easy to do. So I can find my alpha K fairly easily by matrix multiplication. I can substitute it here, I can get the next iterate and then I can find alpha k plus 1 and go through that whole process again and again. It turns out that what you are doing actually at every point of time is as follows. So let's consider m as the set of vector x0 plus, uh, sorry, mk x0 plus summation, I've already used alpha. What should I use? 
let us know beta I am going to use soon gamma. Have we used gamma yet? No, we have not used gamma anywhere. So, gamma. Uh, so, gamma is of course an R. So, this is known as a subspace. So, subspace is like a it is like a plane in high dimensional space. I want to show you what subspace looks like. So, let me erase some stuff. This is my Rn and the subspace here could be a line. So, it could be a line like this. Or it could be a flat surface. So, these two are subspaces. So, this is a small subspace, this could be your m, I do not want to use the same notation. So, this is one subspace, so it is a line which is going all the way to plus infinity on one side and minus infinity on the other side or it could be a plane in this high dimensional space. Now, this is a one dimensional subspace, this is a two dimensional subspace if this was R2, oh sorry R3 and this is one dimensional subspace, two dimensional subspace. The three dimensional subspace will be the entire space itself, R3 itself. So, what we are doing here is, uh, so what the fact is, is that each of these xk uh, yeah. So, x k plus 1 is equal to argument of the function f x, x in m k. So, at every point of time you are picking, so you start with x naught and at every point of time you are minimizing the function f which is a quadratic function there. So, you are minimizing the function f over a subspace. So, going back to this example, at the first instant at time uh, k equals to 1, you are minimizing the function over a line. Then at k equals to 2, you are minimizing the function over a plane. And that k equals to 3, you are minimizing the function over the entire space. Okay? So, slowly and steadily what you are doing is you are expanding the space over which this function is being optimized and eventually you will cover the entire space as k goes to, as k becomes equal to n. So, of course, you can only go from k equals to 0 all the way to k equals to n. Or rather I should say n minus 1 because, because xn will be the optimal solution. So, what you have is xn will be equal to x star. What is the meaning of the subspace at k equals to 0? Isn't that just a point? Uh, I think so. In this, with this particular notation, it is x0 plus gamma 0 d0. So, that is a line. So, you will have an x0, x0 and this is my d0 and this is my minus d0. Is that an r1 or r2? Well, this is for any rn. So, you, you see this line actually does not live on R1, this line lives in a higher dimensional space. Okay? So, uh, think of it as a line in a higher dimensional space and then a plane in a higher dimensional space and then you, know, you can keep expanding it over and over again.
the reason why it's called subspace is because it extends all the way to infinity and uh, it it comes from linear combination of vectors okay the vectors are predecided and then you take the linear combination of vectors you get a subspace any other question Ah, good point. It actually is. Yeah, so, the so MK is an expanding subspace. All of it is in RN, but you can also call it a subspace within a subspace. Yeah. Right. Anything else? Okay. Oh, yeah, go ahead. I was going to say, why does MK contain MK minus 1? Uh, because your gamma k is equal to 0. So if you pick gamma k equals to 0, what you get is mk minus 1. Okay. Right? So that's why it's just expanding along. So going back to this diagram, I'll have to erase this. So this is my x0. This is d0. This is minus d0. And uh, so this is your this is your m one or m zero, and then uh, this side will be d one, and then the function, or rather the subspace m two, is going to look like this. So that's the way to sort of think about this. Sorry, not M2. This should be M1. M1 is going to look like this. So that's how this uh, subspace is expanding. So all of the subspaces have an origin at X0? Yes, exactly. Exactly. They start at X0. So if, if you pick all gamma i's to be equal to 0, what you get is X0. Mm -hmm. Weighted by alpha, uh, okay. gamma. Alpha k. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, gamma is just a placeholder because I'm expanding things all the way to infinity and minus infinity. And next step, we go along the another like uh, d1 direction. Right. And then. Okay. I Maybe I missed a minus d1. So minus d1 is that direction, d1 is going in this direction. So we keep expanding the subspace and we are trying to optimize the function within that subspace. And so eventually you will converge to x star. After n iterations you will converge to x star. That's the property of this algorithm. So in the case of like Newton's method, g0 already points directly. Oh yeah, directly at the optimal solution. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. All the d's have to be on top. Uh, they have to be Q-conjugate. Uh -huh. Yeah. So, uh, they are orthogonal in a very special sense. So, when we talk about the regular orthogonality, Q is actually identity matrix. So, then D1 transpose D2 equals to 0. Then that's an orthogonal in the usual sense. But this is Q-conjugate, so they are orthogonal in some weird sense where you have like a Q matrix in between. We think Q as trans uh, transformation of the space. Mm. Is that kind of like, let's say, all the vectors are perpendicular, like orthogonal in the original space, and let's say we have Q to transform the space, like rotation stretching the space, and we will have we will need to find vectors in that stretch the space to be orthogonal. Is that right? Yeah. See, the thing is that you're not really transforming the space. Uh, you're transforming the inner product defined on the space. So you know how inner products are defined? 
So if you, so you have the space, you can define inner products in multiple ways. For every queue, you get an inner product. So the identity inner product, the inner product with the identity matrix is just the usual inner product that we are all familiar with. But now because we are all master students or we have some BSMS students here, so now we have to go one level above and we now need to expand our definition of inner product. So here the inner product is defined as D transpose Q some other D, D prime. That's how the inner product is defined. And so these vectors are orthogonal in under that particular definition of the inner product. Okay. So it's just uh, coming up with a more general inner product and making sure that our directions are orthogonal under that new inner product that you have defined on the space. The space itself doesn't change. The inner product changes the properties of that space. Is there like a name for this special inner product space? Sorry? Is there a name for this special inner product space? No, I mean, uh, it's all, technically it's called Hilbert space, but. Uh, but Hilbert space is a bit more advanced topic for this class. Okay. Yeah. But generally any, any space with a defined inner product is called a Hilbert space. So we have Rn defined with a specific inner product here and therefore it's a Hilbert space. Um, but we are not going to talk about Hilbert spaces here. Okay. Yes. Uh, so, uh, perfect. So, if you look at x1, okay, let me write it here again. x1 is x0 plus alpha 0 d0. x2 equals to x1 plus alpha 1 d1. I mean, you can keep doing this again and again. So as you can see, you're picking these vectors actually lie in this space, in this subspace, okay? That's the intuition behind why xk plus one is minimizing the function over this particular space, mk. So remember, okay, so let's go back to this. X1 is argmin of let me use gamma f x naught plus gamma d naught. Right? So we are optimizing over gamma. Right? Whether I use gamma or I use alpha, it doesn't matter, right? It's just a variable. So I'm optimizing over gamma, and I'm getting this uh, x1, and then x2, I mean gamma zero is also fine, I think. It's all a variable that I'm using. x naught plus alpha zero d zero plus gamma 1 d1. This is alpha 0, right? This is, what I get is an alpha 0 here. Right, so I'm optimizing over d0. See, remember gamma 0 is just a generic variable, right? So don't, gamma 0 is the same as alpha here. So as you can see, I've expanded the manifold, I've expanded the subspace, and now I'm optimizing over the expanded subspace, and I'm continuing to do this operation again and again. So that's what leads to this particular result. Any other question? So if the alpha k is de uh, determined by the k step, um, so in that direction, dk, the x uh, won't change anymore. So uh, does that need some theorem about the that subspace? Uh, if f in that that subspace is convex or something. Mm -hmm. 
F is always convex. F is convex over the entire space, so for F is convex so, on any so subspace as well. How can you prove that uh, in the end, uh, the, uh, for example, the direction dk, uh, the, the coefficient should be alpha k? Because uh, that's the gradient, that's gradient in that step, but maybe not necessary in the, in the last step. So we haven't yet talked about how d, once you know d0, how do you compute d1 and d2? So right now we have assumed that all the d0 to dn is given to you, even before you started solving the problem. Okay, so now, uh, so far all I have convinced you is, if I give you d0 to dn, or dn minus one, you can go through this process where you just do simple matrix multiplication and uh, you get the value of alpha k and you update your xk and all you are doing is optimizing the function over certain subspaces and the subspace is growing at every iteration and eventually you will converge to x star, okay? So that's all we have discussed so far and now I'll t tell you about how to construct d0, d1, d2 on the fly so you don't have to, uh, yeah, so that's the part that I'll be talking about next. Just give me a second, I have to take her question, yeah. Uh, excuse me, uh, is dk a q conjunct vector? dk? Yeah, is dk a q conjunct vector? That's right. Oh, so, so I want to know about, uh, uh, that means dk transpar q dk is equal to, maybe is equal to zero? Uh, no. Uh, so this is not equal to zero. This is always positive because dk is a non-zero non vector and then dk transpose q is a positive definite matrix. So this is always positive. It's di transpose q dj that is equal to zero if i is not equal to j. So here i is equal to j because both of them are k. So that's why it's not zero. Yes. So I understand what you said, but my question is in this um, session about here, why do you, um, Alpha change to gamma. I, I mean, I'm just using uh, I'm just using this notation here. So I've used gamma here, so that's why I'm using gamma there. Yeah, but I'm saying alpha naught. Yes. So because I've picked alpha naught, so the minimum here. So this, sorry, x1 is not argument. X1 is min. Uh, alpha zero equals to the argument of this expression. So this one, so you can pick whatever variable name you want to pick, it doesn't matter. All you're doing is optimizing with respect to that variable. So I was using alpha earlier, but because I want to be consistent with the notation I've introduced here, I've written it gamma naught here. So alpha naught here is the argument. So I'm substituting the argument here and then I'm optimizing over gamma one next. And then I'll keep doing it again and again to get uh, alpha two, alpha one, alpha two, alpha three, and so on. So the only missing puzzle at this point of time is uh, the assumption that d naught to dn is given to me and you know, at some point of time, we'll have to compute. So given an arbitrary Q matrix, it's not easy to figure out what D1 to Dn is gonna look like. Uh, but one thing you will notice is that we are computing the gradient at every point of time, okay? So somehow, if we could use the gradient to generate uh, this uh, Q conjugate vector, that'll be really cool. And that's exactly what we are going to talk about next. Can I erase this side of the board? Okay, so the, I'm gonna define the gradient as G naught equals to QX naught minus P. These are my gradient vectors. Yeah. 
yeah, that's fine. So I'm going to pick my <coughs> no d0 equals to minus g0 and dk equals to minus gk plus beta k dk minus 1 where beta k equals to g k transpose g k over g k minus 1 transpose g k minus 1 implies d 0 d n minus 1 are Q conjugate. Okay, so somebody put up put a lot of thought lot of effort behind figuring out what is the best way to generate Q conjugate vectors, knowing well that at every point of time I need to be computing the gradient anyways because that is needed for computation of alpha k. So for computation of alpha k, I need the gradient, I need uh, the direction dk, right, and of course computing some of this matrix multiplication. So the puzzle was how do I generate dk or dk plus 1 if I know all of these quantities. And so this is the solution. So I start with negative of the gradient. So my first q conjugate vector is negative of the gradient at time step 0. And then I keep generating new dk's according to the following expression minus gk, so minus the gradient at step k plus beta k times dk minus 1. So remember, we already know dk minus 1. And beta k is given by this expression, all of which is inner product, all of which is just regular inner product. Uh, so again, computing it is very easy because it's all matrix manipulation. So matrix manipulation, matrix, sorry, matrix multiplication, matrix multiplication, matrix addition matrix multiplication and then taking some ratio. So all of these are computationally very cheap activity. And not just it's computationally cheap, even if each of these vectors are across different servers, you can still compute all of these quantities fairly easily. Without, so what you get is a way to, uh, to solve this problem successively so that at time n minus 1, you can get to x star without inverting the matrix at all. Remember, we are interested in q inverse b. We are not interested in q inverse. Okay? So we have completely omitted the step of computing q inverse by replacing it with a bunch of matrix multiplication and ratios, taking ratios. That's it. Okay? So this is known as a conjugate direction method. Any question so far? Yes. Not really. Your midterm is not going to test your memorization ability. Uh, generally, the midterms are open notes, open book, whatever, because it's not going to be useful. <laughs> yes. Excuse me? K? Beta K is, uh, this is a scalar, this is a scalar, so beta K is a scalar. Any other question? Okay. Uh, so, 
there is a small uh, update to this particular way of computing beta k. So I want to write it here itself. You can also compute beta k, and it's all equal. So don't think that. So these two values are actually equal. The only difference is I'm subtracting gk minus 1 from gk in this expression, whereas I'm not doing that in this particular expression. But the two expressions give you the same result. If you go through the math, you will find it out yourself. However, the benefit of this particular method of computing beta k is as follows. You know, here, we are assuming that the function is given in this particular format. Uh, sometimes you might have a function which kind of sort of is quadratic, but it has some other nonlinear terms as well. So the function is actually, uh, it's a quadra quadratic plus some nonlinear terms kind of function, a function that looks like a quadratic function. The thing is that you can still apply the conjugate gradient method because remember, the conjugate gradient method only requires the function gradient to be evaluated. So you can still apply all of this conjugate gradient method technique uh, in order to compute the direction dk and then compute this value alpha k because all it requires is matrix multiplication. So you can still do all this computation. The only thing is if your function is uh, nonlinear, not necessarily quadratic, uh, then this way of computing beta k is a bit more robust in the sense that you can robustly get to the optimal solution. This one might lead to some sort of instability uh, if your function is somewhat nonlinear. So that's why you can either use this for computing beta k or you can use this for computing beta k if you knew that the function is in this format. On the other hand, if the function is not in that format, it could have some nonlinear terms as well then in that case, use this way to compute beta k and you should be fine. You should still get to the optimal solution eventually. Any question? Yes. Uh, yeah, I think there is a somewhat long proof in the book that I'm not going through. Uh, but basically, uh, these two terms turns out to be equal. At least that's what the book is claiming. And then there is a long proof about it in the book. Uh, the difference is constant. Which difference are you talking about? This difference? Uh, not, no, no, that, that's not how it's working. So let's look at it. Does this make sense? This, does this make sense, this expression? And then I know that xk, xk equals to xk minus 1 plus alpha k minus 1 dk minus 1. So I get this expression. Now if you substitute that here, you will see that this term and this term are equal. Because there is a lot of cancellation. Because of the q conjugate vector construction, lot of, uh, I would say, terms gets cancelled, and so these two terms turns out to be equal. But the reason for that is because this is a Q-conjugate vector. 
So when you do all this computation of D1, D, D2, D3, and so on, and you do this inner product, you basically get there's a lot of con cancellations, and these two terms turns out to be equal. That's the way to prove that result. I mean, you can always use induction to prove this, uh, which is an easier way to do it. Any other question? OK. Yes? So the conjugate direction method kind of optimizes the function like one direction at a time? One direction at a time. Okay. Exactly. That's what this, this thing is saying. Any other question? Yes. But there, uh, we're trying to optimize it in the whole subspace, not each step at a time. Uh, it, no. So actually, what we are doing is one step at a time, yeah. which happens to also optimize over the entire subspace. Uh, this part is something we haven't proved in the class, but the proof is there in the book. Yeah. So the fact that you are doing one step at a time and that happens to optimize over this entire space, again, it's a somewhat involved proof, but you can do it. It's done in the book, actually. Is it because all the like, uh, vector conjugate vectors are orthogonal in that space? So one step is the best that we can. Uh, we just need to do one step. One step at a time. Yeah. For that direction. Right. And it's not exactly steepest descent or Newton's method. It is completely new method, okay? Because we are not we are using gradients to compute the conjugate vectors, but it's not really a the usual gradient descent where we are using gradient and then subtracting it from xk. So there's some slight difference with the gradient descent method. Okay, so uh, if there are no further questions, I want to switch to the next topic, which is quasi-Newton method. And I'll give you an introduction. We're not going to talk about quasi-Newton's method today, but I want to give you an idea about what quasi-Newton quasi method is doing so that uh, in the next class, we can uh, go in more details about quasi-Newton's method. So uh, the idea, so I want to minimize f of x, x is in Rn. And of course, the, the Newton's method says So Newton's method says I need to compute the second derivative, then I have to invert this matrix, then multiply it by the gradient. That gives me the Newton's method. And Newton's method is very, very fast. Okay, So it converges to the solution fairly quickly. Now the quasi-Newton method wants to, now remember we are always computing the gradient. We are always computing the gradient at every time step. So if you know the gradient now, and you know the gradient at the next time step, and you know the gradient at the subsequent time steps. Uh, what is the second derivative of a function? Second derivative is the change in the gradient itself, right? That's what the second derivative is trying to measure. So if you're computing gradients, perhaps you can use finite difference formula to compute the second derivative of the function, and then you can invert that function in some way in order to try and mimic the Newton's method. Okay, so that's the idea behind quasi-Newton method. So second derivative is changes in the derivative. Because we are computing derivatives anyway, at different points in the space, we can actually compute, no, we cannot actually compute. We can potentially compute the second derivative by a change, by a difference formula, and use that to mimic the second derivative, and then invert that matrix in order to uh, apply the Newton's method or approximate Newton's method. Yeah. So does it lag by like a single step as you go because you need to know the future? Right. So I think the first 10 or so iterations you will have to do randomly and then after that you can 
or you can initialize this with an identity matrix and then you can keep updating that uh, update uh, uh, based on the successive iterates that are come, successive gradients that are coming out. Okay. Question? No. Okay. Now there is a problem though. The problem is that uh, it's actually it's not really a problem. Uh, the thing that uh, we are going to talk about in the next class, uh, we don't have time for it today, but what we want to do is, so remember this is, uh, I'm going to replace it by DK. Uh, where dk is like second derivative, trying to mimic the second derivative inverse. And what we want to do is update dk in the following fashion. Uh, everyone knows what a rank one matrix is? Rank one matrix, no? Okay, so let's talk about rank one matrices. So consider the following matrix. What do you notice in this matrix? Yeah, so this one is three times the first row, right? I can add some more rows here, five, 10, 15. This is also a matrix where the third row is actually five times the first row. So basically all the rows is some multiple of the first row, okay? So this is known as a rank one matrix. Now remember that DK is supposed to be symmetric, okay? So DK is supposed to be symmetric. So what I want to do is I want to add two rank one matrices here in order to get DK plus one. That's what our algorithm would be. So I'll add two rank one matrices to DK, but both those matrix have to be symmetric matrix. So to get a symmetric rank one matrix, all you have to do is you have a vector A, A, A transpose is a rank one symmetric matrix. Let's look at this matrix A, A transpose. So let's say my A is one, two, three. What is my A, A transpose? It's one, two, three, one, two, three. Is this a symmetric matrix? Right, so it's a symmetric matrix. So A A transpose is an easy way to get a rank one symmetric matrix. So this is a rank one symmetric matrix. Is it a positive semi-definite matrix? It also happens to be a positive semi-definite matrix. And the reason is X transpose, A, A transpose X is actually X transpose A square, which is non-negative. So it's a positive semi-definite matrix. So now I start with a positive definite matrix. I add two rank one matrices to it. This is positive definite. This is positive semi-definite. 
So overall, I get dk plus 1 to be positive definite. So what we are going to do in quasi-Newton's method is we'll exploit the gradient information to construct these matrices A1, A1 transpose, A2, A2 transpose. And then we will add this rank 2 symmetric matrix to dk in order to get another positive definite matrix which is closer and closer to the second derivative inverse. So that's, that's our quasi-Newton's method, which is what we are going to talk about in the next class. So what you need to brush up or what you need to internalize until the next class is that this is a rank one symmetric positive semi-definite matrix. That's all you need to internalize. And then we'll talk about how quasi-Newton's method works. Thank you. Are you going to mention project selection for the Oh. Am I supposed to say something about it? I don't know. It's due in the 20th. <laughs> okay. Uh, I'll, I'll say something about it in the next class then. <laughs>